Coming up, we look back over the week in motorsport to bring you all the latest news. But we'll have to be quick because it's a bumper episode with a load of interviews, including Formula E world champion Nick DeVries, W Series champion Jamie Chadwick, new NASCAR Cup Series champion Kyle Larson, and the retiring legend that is Anthony Davidson. Also, the boss, James Allen, pops in to talk F1 and the FIA presidential election. All that and more coming your way this week on this week's episode of This Week. You've got no idea how many times we tried to film that intro. Uh, welcome to the show, folks. Welcome to this week's episode of This Week with Will Buxton. This is This Week. I am Will Buxton. And let's start quickly because we've got to rattle through the news pretty fast because, as I said, we've got some great interviews coming your way this week. Let's start with Formula One and the Mexican Grand Prix, which was won, as we know, by Max Verstappen. A high-speed game of uh, racing chess played out uh, at the circuit. Hermanos Rodriguez, Lewis Hamilton coming home second. Sergio Perez, the toast of the town. Couldn't quite make it a win, but that third place richly deserved uh, and he just soaked all of that passion and atmosphere up. Uh, Verstappen now moves into a 19 point lead over Lewis Hamilton in the Drivers World Championship. Perez now just 20 behind Valtteri Bottas. Uh, in the Constructors World Championship, Mercedes and Red Bull Racing are just split by one point the point which Valtteri Bottas denied Max Verstappen by stealing away fastest lap at the end of the race. A uh, great fight between Ferrari and McLaren, still there, 13 points between them, and a perfect weekend from Pierre Gasly sees Alpine and Alpha Tauri now level on points. Four races to go, next one in Brazil this weekend, and it's a sprint race. And let's not forget, in the two sprint races that have already happened this year at Silverstone and at Monza, Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton made contact. Not saying they will again, but they might. You never know. Anyway, moving to IndyCar now. And friend of the show, Kyle Kirkwood, uh, has today been announced. There he is in the blue and white car in Indy Lights. Uh, he is, of course, the Indy Lights champion, and he's been announced today uh, as the new driver of the number 14 AJ Foyt uh, car in IndyCar for 2022. Huge congratulations to him, and we wish him well. Uh, which moves us now to Formula E. A little bit of news in Formula E because they are reverting back to their 2020 tyre allocation. They changed it up for 2021 to try and be kind of like a bit more eco-friendly and everything, but it didn't really work. So they're moving back to 2020 tyre allocations, but they're also slashing the amount of time that they will have in practice sessions along with a new quality format uh, and who better to talk us through everything that's going on in the world of Formula E uh, than the reigning world champion Nick DeVries. Nick DeVries welcome to the show uh, thank you so much man for, for, for coming on 2021 world champion in Formula E it's been a while since the last race uh, for you guys uh, how do you sort of reflect back now having had a bit of time to really let the whole season soak in and, and wash over you? Uh, well, I haven't had much time to actually um, <laughs> kind of have some time off to, to really reflect back on our season um, because we've been very much occupied with more F1 duties and a bit more endurance racing. Um, although, you know, I was very, I would say, humble and, and open and honest about my feelings after uh, Berlin winning the championship. Uh, but, you know, looking back to our season now, I, I can comfortably say that uh, yeah, I, I do feel like um, we deserve the championship because uh, ultimately we've been leading majority of the championship and, um, you know, it's, often it looks like a championship is decided uh, at the last race, but ultimately um, equal points are given uh, across the whole season. So if, for example, Saudi would have been in the place of Berlin, perhaps the, the, the view would have been slightly different or if we would have finished in London, um, yeah, that would have been the case as well. So I think we've we've managed to put ourselves in the position to capitalize on, on others' mistakes. And again, we left majority of the championship. Um, so ultimately, um, yeah, we, we were chosen to win this and uh, that won't take, um, no one will take that away from us. Um, big changes 
uh, coming on board for Formula E for next year. Seen some of them obviously announced just this week, a reversion back to the old uh, tyre allowances, uh, a cut in the amount of practice that you guys are going to get, uh, and also a big qualifying change as well. Yeah, specifically, I would say sporting changes. Um, obviously, the biggest being the, the qualifying format, which I very much welcome uh, and encourage because I think we all agreed that the previous format was just not, um, you know, not suiting to the level of competition Formula E is, formerly is um, at the moment. You know, it was just too unpredictable and too um, random, really, uh, with a big penalty for, for doing well uh, when you were in front of the championship. Um, so, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to, to a new and different qualifying, qualifying format, which hopefully will introduce a bit more consistency in the championship and, and uh, which makes it for fans to watch us and ultimately support their team and, and drivers. Um, and then there are some yeah, minor changes con concerning uh, yeah, a shorter free practice session. Tire, tire allocation will be um, yeah, a topic, especially with the new qualifying format um, and then we also slightly increase the power in the race so that will put a bit more energy into our rear tyres so um, along with energy management I think rear tyre management will become a little bit more important as well. The cars are homologated going into into next year in terms of hardware, software obviously is the big change, it's the big battleground for Formula E going into, into next year. How, uh, how hard are the guys at Mercedes working? Uh, how much have you been able to see uh, of the plans and, and everything that, that's going in for, for, for Season 8? Well, I will admit from that side there won't be uh, many changes. Obviously, um, you know, in, in competitive environments uh, such as motorsport and, and here at Mercedes, we, we always, you know, continue to uh, learn and develop. But um, on, on that side, there are not big changes. Uh, but for us as a team, we've obviously previously been based in, in Germany, um, in Affaltebach, where HWA was uh, was based. But now we've moved to, to Brackley, where, yeah, where the Formula One operations are, are, um, are, are based and, and run from. So, uh, that is a, probably our biggest change because, uh, yeah, that that um, changes some people and, and structure within our organization. Um, so we are pushing and working to get uh, ready ahead of the new season. And, um, yeah, hopefully we can hit the ground running in Saudi and be ready for a new, um, a new fight. Uh, now, as a young driver coming through the sport, you're very used to fighting for a championship you know, winning a championship, moving on. You get to defend your championship. How different is that from a mindset perspective of actually having this thing, having this pride, you're a world champion, and you're now going to be able to go and defend that world title? Yeah, you're right. I, I never actually uh, thought of it that way. And, and it will be the first time in, in 10 years that I actually get to uh, defend a championship. The last time that happened was, uh, was in karting winning a world championship but um yeah it is a little yeah a little different i think it also has a special touch to to be the kind of reigning and defending champion um but uh, i very much welcome that you know challenge and uh, i very much look forward to another season and unfortunately the last season for mercedes in the championship yeah. so i think we are all very committed to to end this um you know story and project on on a high uh, and it wasn't just Formula E, of course, that you've been racing very, very busy in the World Endurance Championship as well. How much have you enjoyed uh, endurance racing this year? I, I really love the combination of, of both. Um, ironically, um, you know, in, in Formula 2, in Formula 1, you, you're managing tyres. In, in Formula E, you manage energy. But in endurance racing, I would all, almost say that you, you manage the least of anything, probably the most important thing to manage in endurance racing is your own kind of mental appro approach uh, towards the racing and, and to remain patient and, um, you know, remain focused when you when you get fatigue, especially during the 24 hours of, of Le Mans. So I'm really liking that kind of dynamic. Obviously, you're sharing a car and uh, nothing is ever perfect. So you're always uh, finding the right compromise for, for the team. And, and that really helped me also in, in, I would say, single-seater racing, because um, 
I have a character that can sometimes uh, get lost in the detail, but you know, combining that with endurance racing learned me to understand, uh, or, or, yeah, or learned and helped me to to focus on on the bigger picture and on the priorities rather than, uh, yeah, sometimes the too little details that that don't make uh, the difference. Uh, and you know, just to prove how busy you are, uh, last weekend in Mexico City with Mercedes F1 team as the the official reserve. This weekend, back in Brackley on the simulator. Yes, correct. And then the week after, I'm back in Qatar for um, yeah uh, reserve driver duty. So I am very busy. Uh, obviously, the Formula E season is quite compressed and ending in August. And then naturally, our focus uh, switches a little bit more. Uh, yeah, to, to F1 and, and endurance duties and then um, yeah, during the winter we get a short time to reset and then come back in, in, in Formula E. But um, it's, it's, really, it's really great to be so busy and being involved in different championships and with such great teams because ultimately, you know, it sounds uh, cliche, but, but it is really true that you're, you know, constantly learning and observing uh in in yeah anything you do so um i'm, I'm very much enjoying it i am grateful for all the opportunities i have and yeah i hope to uh, continue to do well um it looked a few months ago like one of those opportunities might have been an f1 seat i, I don't want to draw you too much on it because i don't know how much you can <laughs> or can't say but um how how close did that did that come man um, well, first of all, I was, I was, I felt honored that, um, you know, my name was, uh, going around and people were linking me to, to Formula One teams. Uh, ultimately, um, I don't have that much control, uh, over any, um, rumors or speculations or, or even opportunities because the only thing I can really control is, is my uh, performance on, on track. And that's where my focus and priority is. And I think that's the only way to, to um, yeah, continue my career forward and to continue to open up new opportunities. So I will continue to do that. And I will admit that every young driver shares the same dream and goal, and that is to become a Formula One driver. And, and you know, I'm still young, so I, I would lie if I say um, I, I don't share that dream uh, and goal anymore. But ultimately, um, you know the Formula One better, probably better than me, and um, <laughs> uh, th that's why I just stay, you know, focused on my job and and let um, the rest uh, dealt with uh, by itself. Well, you're doing an impeccable job, man. A world champion, uh, a brilliant season for you. Personally, I'd love to see you racing in Formula One. Uh, but if it's not going to be this year, then watching you defend your crown in Formula E is, is going to be a, a massive thrill as well. Just before I let you go, a quick one. And, and this will probably get you in trouble as well. I'm really sorry. But you, you obviously are a Mercedes contracted driver. We're in the midst of a fascinating Formula One battle between Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton for the world championship. You're Dutch. So... Any split loyalties? Uh, would, you, would you be happy to see Max win, or can you not say that? And you, you're, you're, you're all Lewis. <laughs> you're very kind to me today. Um, <laughs> well, I think I, I'm, I'm going to be very political here. I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> I think um, we, uh, we as uh, <gasps> Formula One and motorsport fans must be very grateful for this incredible fight for the championship and may the best man win. Love it. I thought Mercedes had pulled the plug just before you gave that answer because you just froze. Um, <laughs> but, but perfect. Uh, great stuff, Nick. Thanks for coming on the show, man. <laughs> yeah, we got it. We got it. We got okay, it. Okay, okay, uh, good, good. Dude, thank you so much. Um, I'll see you very you. soon. And thanks for coming on the show, man. See you now, buddy. Have a nice day. Thank you. Hey, he's gone all corporate. Uh, I wasn't expecting him to give us a proper answer. Uh, great to hear from Nick DeVries uh, and can't wait to see him defend that crown next year. Right, moving on with the news and we move into MotoGP where Peko Bagnaia uh, won the Algarve Grand Prix, which was red flagged on the penultimate lap. Uh, possibly the big news, though, from the week is that Marc Marquez will miss the season finale uh, after taking a, a concussion um, during an off-road training trip during the week. So uh, Marc Marquez, who'd had such a great uh, comeback this year, 
out of the season finale. Uh, in Moto2, Remy Gardner beat Raul Fernandez uh, to put one hand on the title with one round remaining. But in Moto3, the championship is run. Pedo... Ped almost got there pedro acosta i'm so sorry is your 2021 moto 3 champion uh dennis fodger was uh tipped off on the last lap of the race uh, congratulations to pedro acosta a great season for him uh which brings us now to nascar uh which had their final round at phoenix what a brilliant season it's been um but this man kyle larson won the race won the championship his consistency this year has been astonishing 20 top fives 18 top threes 10 wins and five of those wins came of course in the playoffs he is the cup series champion and uh, after everything that went down in 2020 being let go by ganassi being picked up by hendrick what an incredible story for this young man and uh i'm i'm so so happy uh that in the week that he is crowned champion he has given up his time to be here on our show nascar cup series champion how does that sound it's uh i don't know if it's quite hit yet but it sounds good um <laughs> definitely a really cool weekend there in phoenix i mean you say a great weekend but what a great year the whole season just seemed to come to you 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 you've been competitive from the off competitive all the way through it's just been i mean we, we've been covering it the, the whole year uh on this show and it's just been such a joy to watch you race man yeah thanks no it's been a a great year and nascar dirt racing everything that i get to do it's been a been an awesome season so um 10 wins plus all-star win and a championship in the cup series is something i never honestly dreamt about so i'm um, just proud of the hard work proud of the the season that we put together and, and hopefully we can repeat it uh, many times <laughs> and it's the consistency as well you know across the board for the season i think what, what is it 20 top fives for the year uh, as well w where does that come from because i mean we, we we can get into this in a while you know because obviously it's it's your first year with hendrick it just it seemed like it just just clicked immediately yeah definitely i think you know hendrick's just got a great organization uh hundreds of extremely smart um you know men and women who work there uh they hold themselves all to a high standard and um, it makes you as a driver want to you know compete at a high level each and every time you hit the racetrack to reward them for their hard work so um you know it's probably a little more data than i've ever been able to you know, be around so i think that helps on the prep side of things for me and you know the pit crew is amazing as it showed you know this past weekend at phoenix so uh they just got all the pieces and and when you have that it makes things really easy how much did you know about the team, the way it operates, the, the vibe, the feeling in the place before you actually joined? Well, I think you kind of, before I got there, you, you have an idea of, of what Hendrick Motorsports is like just based off their reputation. But once I got there, um, it was that times 10. You know, it's just so professional. Every, everybody's got a huge amount of respect for Rick Hendrick. And I think because of that, you know, they want to make him proud every single day uh, that they go to work. So, um, you know, they're always working their butts off. Um, the, pro the professionalism is, you know, unmatched, I think, in the in the Cup Series. So I'm just very fortunate to be a part of it. And I hope I can be there for a very long time. 2020 was 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 a hell of a year for so many people uh, around the world for, for for you as well i know you know everything got got upended when that call came from hendrick do you remember where you were and 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 how it felt and what your immediate reaction was yeah so when everything happened in 2020 uh i went back you know dirt racing uh, throughout the yeah. united states racing sprint cars and stuff and was having an amazing season uh, last year. And I remember I was in Port Royal, Pennsylvania, uh, racing a sprint car race that weekend. And Jeff Gordon had given me a call uh, sometime in the afternoon and said, hey, I don't know like what he wants to talk to you about, but Rick wants to have a meeting with you and I. So uh, as soon as you can get home, hurry up and we'll go meet with him. So I was driving my motorhome up, up and down the road all last year. And uh, we won that night. I hauled butt home and 
got showered and went down to meet with them. And uh, that night kind of you know, changed my life. So um, it was a fairly quick meeting, I felt like, and uh, everything that, that I thought it would be. Oh, man, that's amazing. Um, obviously, one of the big parts of, of your year, one of the keys to your success has been the relationship with, with, with your crew chief, with Cliff Daniels. Um, why did that relationship work so well and so instantly? Well, I think I think I'm an easy person to work for or work with. Uh, I'm really easygoing, um, pretty laid back. I know nothing about race cars, so I think I think as a crew <laughs> chief you know, engineer, I think that's good because I just allow him to do his job and uh, his leadership skills too are unmatched. Um, his communication, I think, is what makes him such a good crew chief. Uh, he's young, you know. He's only a few years older than I am, mm. um, and you know, with all the dirt racing that I do also you know he's become a big fan of that and you know i think that helps him kind of learn who i am as a race car driver and, and helps us be fast on the weekends in the in the cup car because he came out to see you race on the dirt tracks didn't he before you guys made your debut your competitive debut together what did you what did you learn about each other you know in those in those all important <laughs> days before you you actually went and to, to compete in cup yeah i think it was good for him to go there um just to kind of see how I communicated with the crew chiefs, um, you know, how I explain things, how I feel the race car. Um, and then, you know, he got to talk to Paul Silva, who's my, my sprint car crew chief quite a bit. You know, I was racing a dirt late model also that week and he got to talk to Kevin Rumley, that crew chief and kind of pick their brains on, on how I am. And I think just getting that jump start on the communication side of things made things, you know, kind of flow a little bit easier once we got into the off season and, into the season so um like i said cliff is just a you know he's always like one step ahead and uh he he's, he has a plan for everything and i think you know him getting to learn me early on helped all that when did you know that this year could be the year because i imagine you're getting used to a new team you're getting used to a new crew chief and things are going pretty well and you're sitting there thinking okay this is pretty good but was there a moment where you just went Oh wow! Like this, this could be better than good. Like this could be something really amazing. It was pretty early on in the year. I mean, I, I've I've had that kind of thought that it could be this type of season. Maybe not to the extent of the wins and stuff that we had, but you know, I'm going to a team that Chase Elliott had just won the championship with. Um, you know, Jimmy Johnson. I, I took over his team, uh, the 48 yeah. cars team. We just you know, swapped numbers and they were really fast at the end of last year. So I had the thought that we could do it. Um, just didn't know, you know, it felt like new team, new crew chief, new driver there. Like maybe it would take some time to mesh, but, um, from early on, I mean, maybe the, the fourth race or so, I felt like wow. we had the potential to you know, have a great season and it just kept getting better and better. So, um, it was just great to have that consistent speed and, and contend for a lot of wins. And then what an amazing year, like out on track, uh, you with the consistency, with the wins. Denny Hamlin, you know, was right up at the top with you all the way through. And, and we talked about it week in, week out, like when's the guy going to get a win? Because he was, he was right up at the top, but couldn't, couldn't buy a win for, for the majority of the season. Um, it was so tight between you guys all the way through, between, between Hendrick and Joe Gibbs racing as well. Just it, talk to us about how, how tight that was, how tough it was, you know, going into that, and then particularly going into the playoffs at the end where it's it's all on the line. Yeah, definitely. It was a, uh, a fun kind of battle with, with Denny all throughout the, the season, really, from start to finish. Um, you know, he's a good friend of mine, and uh, it, was, it was fun to kind of be, you know, the top two guys all year long and, and pushing each other with that consistency. You know, I, I, I went on a great streak of wins, um, but he was always up there in the top five, too. So it was hard to kind of chip away at his point lead that he had gotten so early on in the year. And um, like I said, I think we just kind of pushed each other to you know, execute every race. And then once it came to the playoffs time, we were already used to you know racing hard and being smart and, and trying to finish as high up as possible, not make any mistakes. And I think that's why we each had a good uh, final 10 races as well. So um, I'm, I'm glad, too, that we were both in the final four. Uh, as long or as well as you're know, getting to compete with your know, Chase Elliott, my teammate, Martin Truex, who's always up front. So yeah. uh, it was a battle all the way down to the end. 
We've loved watching it, man. We, we've absolutely loved watching it. Um, it's also been great, you know, to see how much other racing you've been doing this year. Uh, as you said, you know, the dirt racing is so important to you. How many races do you think you've contested this year? Because I know you won, you won the Chili Bowl, you won the Knoxville Nationals, you won uh, the BC39. Like, like you have been competing and winning. How many, how many races have you actually done in 2021? Uh, so to this point, I think I ran, I think I read somewhere, I ran 89 races uh, to wow. today and won, won 30 of them. And I still have probably another eight or nine left. So I'll, I'll probably be close to 100. So, um, which is not the busiest year I've ever had. I ran 120 <laughs> something races in 2012. So um, these last two years, though, have definitely been my most successful and uh, just fortunate that I get to race a bunch of different cars. Man, hats off to you. That's that's some calendar, and and what a win streak uh, as well. Uh, what is next for you? Is it like take the time, chill, decompress, like just completely let what has happened this year wash over you and enjoy it, or are you in practicing? And as you, well, I know you've got a few races left this year, but uh, yeah, what's next, man? Yeah, staying, staying pretty busy. Uh, I'm going to take this weekend off uh, to enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> but then I'm going to head to uh, head to California, run a bunch of dirt races out there. And then I'm really excited. I've never been to a Formula One race before, but I'm going to go to uh, my wife and I are going to go to Abu Dhabi. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Go check that out and see what it's all Amazing. about. And then, yeah, and then some more dirt races come January and February. And that rolls right into NASCAR. Well, you know, there's a rookie test in F1 uh, after the, the Abu Dhabi F1 weekend. So, like, you know, you're over there anyway. Let's see what we can get sorted, you know, if you're going to be there. <laughs> I'm down. I, didn't, I had no idea that there was a rookie test. But, hey, if, I, if I'm there, I might as well get in a car. So uh, if there was ever a team that would let me, I would, I would pack my helmet bag right now and, <laughs> and head there and go get some laps. So uh that'd be cool let me know dude well i reckon re pack your pack your lid and uh let, let's see um it's on record now so let's let's get carl in the car um my man congratulations genuinely what a brilliant year and just the entire narrative arc of of the last couple of seasons what what a what a, an incredible journey and uh it's been a joy a genuine joy watching you race this year and uh i'm, I'm delighted for you just a, a brilliant championship and thoroughly deserved yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks a bunch for having me on. Hopefully, if you're at Abu Dhabi, I'll get to meet you in person. Yeah, can't wait, man. Cannot wait. Uh, all the best. Travel safe. We'll see you in Abu Dhabi. All right, see ya. Thanks. Thanks, man. What a nice guy. Like, genuinely, what a lovely bloke. Um, that was one of my favourite interviews of the of the season so far. Absolutely great stuff. Uh, good show, right? Um, and uh, anybody watching, uh, any of the F1 teams, that guy wants an F1 test. And did he quote Days of Thunder halfway through that interview? I'm pretty sure he did. Right, more news. Dakar, quite incredibly, Dakar news. We have Dakar news. Probably should have rolled it in with the MotoGP news. But Danilo Petrucci, um, uh, of course, a, a MotoGP winner, he's going to go to Dakar with KTM, uh, just announced. So uh, having lost his seat uh, in MotoGP, or his ride, I should say, in MotoGP, uh, he's off to the Dakar. Uh, sticking with off-road type stuff, WRC, uh, Ot Tanak will miss Rally Monza. His place uh, will be taken for that final round of the season uh, by Timu Suninen, uh, who will deputise for him. Uh, Sebastian Ogier, meanwhile, has announced that he will contest uh, the Monte Carlo rally that always kicks off the WRC season at the start uh, of the new regulations in 2022. And sticking with Seb Ogier news, we flip over from WRC to WEC, the World Endurance Championship had their last round of their season and Ogier was taking part in the rookie test for Toyota and it was a very happy Toyota, which of course wrapped up another World Endurance Championship title, uh, this time though the very first of the hyper car era. Um, Jose Maria Lopez, Kamu Kobayashi, Mike 
Conway are the champions uh, and just deservedly so. Just a, a brilliant year from them, uh, of course, won at Le Mans as well and cap off a brilliant season with the World Endurance Championship. Uh, in the sister car, Kazuki Nakajima announced that he will be stepping down from his seat uh, in the Toyota Hypercar squad. He's had a 20-year career with Toyota. They've um, backed him all the way through junior series racing all the way up uh, through his career at Le Mans uh, but he'll be stepping back hasn't stated yet whether that means he'll be moving into super formula or anything like that or whether he's just retiring seems a bit young to retire but uh, anyway we wish Kazuki well uh, also in the hypercar class news this week that Glickenhaus who are very unhappy with BOP rules and regulations have been told enter a car for every round of the world endurance championship next year or don't bother turning up it's all getting a little bit nasty um right wrt won the lmp2 honors uh, a great season for them the number 31 car uh, of uh, Habsburg Freins and Malesi uh, congratulations to them but it is not yet clear who's won GTE Pro because the race the season ended in acrimony in Bahrain because of this moment Peguidi into the back of Christensen, bumped him round. Ultimately, Ferrari would go on to win um, GTE Pro and Porsche not. Now, in the race, Ferrari was told, give the position back. Slowed right down to allow Christensen to take the place back, but he came into the pits, so they couldn't give it back. And even when the Ferrari came into the pits, apparently by that point, the call to give the place back had then been rescinded. So, uh, yeah, uh, appeals, reappeals, all of that, it's at appeal. We don't know what's happening and we won't know for a while. But uh, yeah, disappointing end then to GTE Pro, which has been such an exciting part of the World Endurance Championship calendar. Uh, as we said, Seb Ogier was doing the rookie test uh, after the end of the season, but so too was our next guest. It is double W Series champion, Jamie Chadwick. Back to back W Series titles. Uh, Jamie Chadwick, thanks for joining us. What an amazing season. What an amazing, well, I'd say two seasons, but it's like three years. Uh, it's been a crazy time for you, but what, what a brilliant year and, and many congratulations on the title. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it does feel like a long time, to be honest. And I think because 2019 felt so long ago, it almost feels a little bit more kind of special now uh, to, to win in 2021. So, yeah, just uh, happy to finally have yeah got that second one. Uh, and it was a tough championship year. You and Alice were so close all the way through the season. Um, how much more difficult was this second W Series year than the first? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the whole season, it just felt like I was so hard, well, closely fought. And it was, yeah, one weekend I'd have an advantage, the next weekend Alice would be uh, ahead and it would just be kind of ebbing and flowing the whole season. Whereas in 2019, I didn't really have that. And in 2019, it was only six races as well. So I felt like I was able to get ahead at the beginning and then kind of just maintain it. And this season, it didn't feel like that at all. Every time I'd have a bit of momentum, it'd swing the other way. So yeah, it was definitely much tougher, I would say. Um, but yeah, obviously happy that we still managed to get the best result out of it. Um, over a, a W Series weekend, for, for those that aren't, you know, too sort of familiar with, with the series, um, how much can you yourself as a driver sort of input into the direction that the car takes? Obviously, it's a spec series. We, we, we're very used to spec series in, you know, in junior formula. But um, with W Series itself all sort of being run by one outfit rather than individual unique teams like a, you know, a Prima, an ART, a, 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 a whoever, what, what, what input do you have? Honestly, not that much, um, or at least I didn't have that much. Um, it felt like because the cars are centrally run um, and we don't get that much time on a weekend and actually the parameters that we're allowed to change on the car are fairly limited, I think. So, for example, you can change the front wing, the rear bar, and I think that's more or less it. Um, there's no damper changes or anything like that. But it kind of felt like it was a driver's championship. You kind of felt what you had at the beginning of the weekend you can make small adjustments but really that was what you had and there's not really anything you can do around the tyre strategy really and so it kind of just took that whole argument or you know I guess debate that is it the car or not out of the question and the other thing they do as well is they swap um, the whole rear end of the car if you finish in the top three 
and randomly select, you know, three other drivers that it will get given to for the next weekend. So that really took out any of the, oh, well, she's got a faster engine um, than me kind of arguments, which in my opinion kind of made it a little bit more spicy, but also I think, um, yeah, took any of those kind of arguments out of the, out of the question. Wow. Uh, so how much were you having to drive around the car? How much were you having to adapt, change your driving style to suit, you know, what, what, whatever the car was that, that was given to you? Yeah, massively. That was a big part of it. Um, and sometimes I did it better than others. And you can see, I think over the year, that's why Alice and I were, you know, so closely fought because there'll be one weekend where she would just do a better job at adapting and yeah, feel the balance that she has better and make, you know, a better step with it and there's other weekends that I would do it so I think that's why it was a bit like that this season um you can never get the clear advantage after one weekend that, that you would get maybe in another series so yeah it was a lot about adapting and also because we we're on the Formula One weekends which was a first for me the way that the track evolves over the weekend um is something I've not experienced before and you know how much rubber goes down from being the first car out on track on on the Friday to then yeah racing after qualifying on the Saturday it was yeah, a massive evolution for the track. I wanted to, to, to bring that point in next, actually, being the, the undercard, being the F1 support was obviously it's massive for the championship and just shows, you know, how successful it had been in, in its first season. The fact you're getting super license points as well for, for W Series. Um, what did it mean for you, for all uh, the competitors in the W Series to be on that F1 support, to be right in the focal point, not just of the fans at the track, but of the F1 teams and their sponsors and partners? Yeah, it was a big step up, I'd say. Um, when we're on the weekends, because of the COVID bubbles, you know, as well as I do, we didn't really yeah. interact that much with, um, you know, the F1 teams as such. So you didn't notice a massive difference there. But from a driving point of view, the big thing was the circuits you went to. Um, they were, in my opinion, the best circuits in the world, um, or some of them were. So, yeah, to have the chance to go to those and race on those, those tracks was a big step up. But then, yeah, it's a really small... Uh, it sounds like a small thing, but after the weekend, the amount of you know attention that the series would get in comparison to 2019 was so much greater. And yeah, that really was a direct result of being a part of the Formula One package. Now, when W Series launched, it didn't launch without controversy. There were those who said there's no place in the world for W Series. It, it, it shouldn't exist. You know, women should be able to compete in the same championships as men. This is you know, this is taking women out and, and, and putting them uh, you know, in a separate place and actually uh, undoing a lot of the good work uh, that, that women have been trying to do in, in trailblaze a path through the sport. Do you think now after two seasons of the W Series that it has sort of quelled those suggestions, that, that it actually does stand on its own feet and has, has managed to silence those critics? Uh, I really think so. And I think it's difficult because okay, it's maybe not the ideal situation to have a separate series for, for women, but in the long term, that won't be the case. And what the situation, in my opinion, is, is that they've done more, or what W Series has achieved overnight is more than, you know, anyone has managed to do for women in the sport. We've got, yeah, 18 girls racing in these kind of Formula 3 level cars. Um, you know, it's an opportunity that I don't think any of us would have had without without the series. And it's created more professional racing opportunities for all of us. So from a yeah progression of women in motorsport point of view i think it's been super successful and i hope it can only go from strength to strength and the field can get stronger and stronger and at some point we won't need there won't be a need for the w series and we'll have um you know men and women able to kind of compete in the same sort of you know ladder and feeder series that, that the men are doing very well put very well put uh will jamie chadwick return to defend her crown for a third time uh, very unlikely. Um, I feel like, you know, obviously returning in 2021, it felt like an obvious choice because of the stakes and the fact it was on the Formula One package and the super license points. And I didn't quite have the budget together to, to progress into something like F3. But now I want to use and showcase W Series for what, you know, it is. And that is the platform, the springboard to kind of push you up into higher ranks. So I'd like to, to hope that the opportunities are there to do that. And whilst nothing's being confirmed, I think yeah, it's very unlikely that, that I'd return to W Series. So what is next for you? I know you were out in Bahrain. I know you had the, the World Endurance Championship LMP2 test last week uh, with Rishabh Mill. First of all, how did that go? It was cool. I really enjoyed it. It took me a long time to adapt, to be honest, actually. It's a very different car. 
Um, the driving style, we only had a handful of laps, but driving style required for it is quite different. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. And it's a super fun car. And for me, something like Le Mans is, is on my bucket list for sure. So um, I do really, really want to get involved in a programme like that, potentially, if, if the opportunity is there. Um, and yeah, I guess in terms of what's next, um, it's weighing up the options. I think the well, the motorsport fans will say, why not F3 or F2? Um, and yeah, we're looking at those options. The difficulty with something like F3 is we're in November now and I've missed the test and I'm a bit late to the party to to try and push for a top team. So we need to see what other opportunities there are available there. And yeah, outside of that, what, what the next obvious step is. But I think there's a good amount of um, opportunity now, um, particularly, like you said, with the Richard Mill thing as well, um, to to hopefully have, um, you know, a good and exciting next year. Does the road to Indy uh, interest you at all? Looking at, you know, and we've, we've been talking about it on this show for the last few weeks, looking at guys like uh, David Malukas and Carl Kirkwood and, and the progression that the top drivers uh, in Indy lights always get year on year uh, to move into IndyCar. Might that be, be, be something that, that, that you would be interested in or is the focus very much sort of F3, F2, F1 ladder? A hundred percent. You know, it's something that's definitely, you know, on my radar and something I've looked at and will um, love to explore. I think at the moment, you know, the relationship I have with Williams, um, the focus is still a little bit more on Europe and seeing what opportunities are here. But I think what America offer and, you know, their ladder is a proven pathway. So it's nice to know that there could potentially always be an option available there that has a really good structure to it that um, yeah, could be an option in the future. Cool. For what it's worth, I think you'd be awesome. I think Indy Lights would be would be totally <laughs> rocking. Uh, Jamie, what's next for you then? Uh, we are, I mean, incredibly edging towards December. Uh, have you got a very busy, busy winter lined up? I know there's one race left in the uh, Extreme E season. Are you heading back for the for the for the Dorset race, the Jurassic Park uh, Grand Prix, uh, X Prix? Uh, not confirmed yet. I mean, I'm at Veloce now, and every time I see them, I tell them I want to do it. So it's not confirmed yet. I mean. I missed the last few races, so I completely understand if they weren't to take me. But um, yeah, I'd love to do it. I really enjoyed the first two races I did in Extreme E. It's a, a very, very different challenge. But yeah, I think if I do end up being selected for that, then I will probably have quite an intense program over the next few weeks to get me back up to speed um, in the off-road world. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm sure we'll still be busy um, somewhere. But it'll be nice to enjoy a little bit of, of downtime as well now I've got it. Excellent. Uh, well, I hope you do get some downtime, some time to digest everything that you've achieved this year. Uh, congratulations again. A brilliant season. It's been wonderful watching you race and uh, I cannot wait to see uh, where your career takes you next. Thanks for joining us, Jamie. Yes, thanks so much, Will. Lovely to hear from Jamie Chadwick. Will she be racing stateside? or in the World Endurance Championship. Decisions, decisions, um, decisions, easy for me to say. Um, now, of course, one of the biggest pieces of news from the weekend, and one of the things I didn't mention during the news segment, because it makes me cry, um, is that Anthony Davidson uh, announced his retirement uh, as a racing driver at the weekend, uh, rolling in his final two races in the Bahrain six hours and the Bahrain eight hours. What an amazing career. What a great guy. And I'm very happy to say he's on the show. Anthony, mate, back at home. And I've got to ask, retirement now, for the first time since you were a kid, for the first time I imagine you can remember, you're sitting at home not thinking about where the next race is that you're going to compete in. Has it, has it started to sink in yet? Does it, does it sort of all feel, all feel real? Yeah, it, it does definitely feel real. Um, you know, for me, this has been a, it's, it's not a surprise. It's been a, a bit of a, a long time coming. I, I could feel this in myself that it was, getting closer to the right time to, to step away. But obviously for, for the rest of the world that, that weren't necessarily aware of that, it comes as a surprise and therefore, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a little bit different to how I've seen it play out um, over, the, uh, over the months or, or years coming up to this, this moment in time. But yeah, when you stop and think about it, you know, like you say, since an eight-year-old kid, I've been holding the steering wheel and driving the go-kart all the way up to to the heights of Formula One and then sports cars. And yeah, it's been 34 years of, of racing and competition. Um, and, and that, you know, that starts to take its toll after a while. Um, 
as you say, it's it's not a surprise to you. It's a decision that that you know has been a long time coming. So you say, if it's been a long time coming, that suggests you've you've toiled with it. It's it's been a tough one to make. How hard or ultimately easy was it to take that decision to step away? I think it all started to it started to float around the mind around the Toyota years. Like the last big contract I signed there was a three year deal. Um, that would see me through to the end of uh, 2019, and um, I had already, I had already kind of considered that as I would be 40 years old at the end of that time. Um, we didn't know what was going to be happening to LMP1, um, even whether Toyota would still be around, and you know I just saw that as a, a three-year deal at that age was was very good and. You know, I was on good money and I just thought it'd be quite a nice time to to wrap it all up perhaps by the end of that. And yeah, I just thought at 40 to still be competing at that level after the years that I'd done there and all the achievements I, that I'd had, um, it was just, I, I floated the idea in my head at, at that point when I signed that three-year deal and then it, it ended and it didn't really end the way I wanted it to. And I think that's what, that's what kind of spurred me on to do more and then find a new love for it in LMP2 to drive with uh, Roberto Gonzalez, my teammate, um, who took me on. Uh, he's a gentleman driver and an AM driver. And they look at their racing in a, in a very different way to us professional racers. And, um, and it was fun again. And we had fun on and off the track. Um, but still with some with good results, and I'm really glad that I had this last final period of racing to just basically go back to to my roots of just going out racing for fun again. Um, although, like I say, the the results were, were still there, and you still want to to have good results, but it wasn't wrapped up in in all this kind of seriousness and this pressure that that I once had. Um, you talk about enjoyment and and finding that over the last few years what what was it that caused you to lose that enjoyment um was it the way it sort of you know it ended with with fernando being brought in at, at toyota for that for that run that, that that he had was it i don't know the nature of the cars maybe and that you know moving to, to lmp2 allowed you that freedom that that enjoyment again yeah well, you know the end of the toyota thing was a little bit messy porsche had already left audi had left before them and I guess that it just gave Fernando nowhere to go. He, he was originally talking to Porsche and then once they left, um, his only opportunity was with Toyota. And it was a situation where, where basically he, he had to be in, in LMP1 and I think the WEC wanted him, Toyota wanted him and it was just a case that they had already six drivers lined up. Um, I had just signed a, a three-year deal I think I was probably the most accommodating. I was already toying with the idea, like I said, of stopping anyway at the end of 2019. And I think I was just the easiest uh, option really for, for the team. And we spoke about it and yeah, I continued on in, in a testing role and as a reserve role and other things as well, the projects that TMG had on the go, like their road car development, for example. Um, we've all seen the, the GR Yaris that's out there now, this phenomenal little little uh, hot hatch and I was involved in the development of that as well so it's really you know different avenues and I was thinking about what do I do next with my uh, with my skill set that I have as a test and development driver from old back in my F1 days and I saw perhaps the the path of road car development as well as, as something I could do so it all fitted quite well but honestly speaking I, I would have still preferred to have been racing and ended it um, the way I wanted to end it on my terms. Um, and I think that's why, in a way, I, I kind of lost a bit of love for it. Um, and I could see the way that the cars were going as well in the future with the hypercars becoming uh, a bit heavier, slower and, and losing downforce. And that's never really been my style. I've, I've always enjoyed basically anything that's been closer to an F1 car or, or, or a, or a go-kart, for example, high grip, um, situation that's that's always been something I've excelled at and yeah you weigh up all these things combined with wanting more family time at home and um, yeah it was a uh, quite a an easy decision to come to actually I was I was quite surprised <laughs>
<laughs> they're, they're always the right decisions, I think, the ones that are yeah. the easiest to come to. <laughs> um, mate, I, I mean, I remember first seeing you on TV in a go-kart, like when you were a, a kid, followed your career all the way through. I, I loved watching you in Formula One. I remember I remember Istanbul Park in the Super Aguri days. When was it? 07. And that, that unbelievable <clears throat> lap that you put in uh, to qualify, I think, P11, was it? I mean, that was, was one it of was, the all-time... Yeah. One of the all-time great laps it was just that car had no right to be where you put it um you 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 know you've won the world endurance championship you've achieved so much in in your career what what for you stands out now is something that you're you're really proud of yeah it's funny you know when you when you stop and you you actually have time to reflect for the first time in in your career um you obviously look back at race results sometimes and you look at your especially in sports car racing, you look at your stint times compared to other drivers um, and, and how that stacks up and, and, you know, maybe things you could have done better, but also the, the, the achievements that you, that you're able to achieve that, that past weekend, but that's only as far back as you can ever look when you're in there doing it. You're always looking forward. And now I find myself looking back over the whole umbrella of my career and, and I, I'm I'm proud of what I've achieved. I'm I'm proud I got to Formula One without any backing, and yeah. and uh, you know I had a manager that, that funded the the Formula Ford and Formula Three days, but you know of which I've since um, paid back. But um, you know I, I I don't come from a, a family that that's wealthy. Uh, yes, we did karting, and that was quite an extravagant sport, I guess, compared to other sports. But I didn't come from a family of money, and um, every 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 inch was a scrape to get by and um and to get to the heights of formula one and to be there on the grid was i see a you know i'm proud of what i did it's a massive achievement that only a select few drivers around the world can ever that ever can, can say that they've achieved so um and then the results on top of that you know moving into sports cars as well and becoming a an fia world champion um in lmp1 is is something i always look back on fondly and and, and it's just, you look back at that entire career and you think, wow, actually, it's in a way you look back with, with rose tinted glasses now. Before you look back in a kind of negative, or you're always quite strict on yourself, quite hard on yourself and in a negative way. Um, that's how I always seem to get the best out of myself, being overly critical. And now that's gone, I don't have to do that anymore. I look back and, and like with, with a happier mindset and, and realize the achievements uh, I, I had in this sport. Um, not a lot of people know that it was Super Aguri it was, was one of the teams that came up with that double diffuser uh, back in 08 for the 09 season and that had Aguri not gone under and the staff kind of proliferated and gone off, some of them to Toyota, some of them to, to Honda uh, and Braun as it would become that you guys would have turned up in Australia in 2009 with that car. And I still stand by the fact you would have won the Australian Grand Prix and possibly gone on to fight for the World Championship. Well, I don't want to dwell on that. <laughs> but but what I do want to dwell on is, 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 is how ultimately that led you to be picked up by Honda, who then pulled out as well. Um, but but that then you ended up at Braun. And then you ended up as part of this Mercedes Formula One team and all of the success that they've had there. And you don't speak about it a lot and not a lot's made out of it. But I don't think Mercedes would have achieved what they've achieved without the work that you've put in behind the scenes at that team. You have been a vital part of that squad at Mercedes. How much personal satisfaction do you take from the work that you've done in the simulator, in developing that car, in, in being such a, an important part of, of that world championship winning team? Yeah, I mean, look, I love the simulator work. There are lots of drivers out there, they, they see it as a, a bit of a pain having to do sim on top of their own racing. But I think as I was getting closer to the end of my years as, a, as an active racing driver, I kind of turned a lot of my focus and attention to the simulator. And for me, it's, it's quite often the closest I'll, I'll ever get to driving a Formula 1 car. So for me, it was always exciting. And to be involved at the very highest level in this sport with the best team out there uh, is, is, is something I can't really put into words. It, it's, uh, I th it fitted quite well because I've been with the team in, in obviously with different guises over the years in, in Brackley. Um, but 
I'm very proud of the the people there, and um, you know, especially the, the the personnel that have been there right from the beginning. When pretty much when I was there back in 2002, that was when I first became associated with the with the team in Brackley, and I've seen it change and grow over these years and um, to become the formidable formidable force that it is today it's it's I do feel like I have been part of that team since since those days and even when I went off to Super Aguria it was effectively still part of that team um, from, from you know it was designed and, and built in Brackley and I ran that team in, in that car albeit with a different team Super Aguri um, so I've always been involved with them um, in, in my F1 time and yeah to be part of the simulator program now I mean I, I've never been one to blow my own trumpet and say yeah it was all to do with me I'm one of many <laughs> simulator drivers there um, but thank you for your, your kind words Will on that one um, well, but Louis, Louis, Louis always says he doesn't need to run the simulator and there's a reason he doesn't need to jump in the simulator it's because he's got the best in the business doing it for him <laughs> Well, like, like I say, you know, I, I've, I've turned a lot of my dedication and focus to it. Um, and I've, I've really enjoyed that time, not just developing the, the hardware on the simulator itself um, in the latest sim that they have there in Brackley, but also the software. And, and, and each weekend that comes, um, pre or post event that I'm involved with, you always learn something. But at the same time, I can look back and use my experience as, a, as an old test driver to understand what the engineers want from the day and what they want from the car setup and help to not just give them feedback in terms of car balance and where we should take it, but also how you should structure the day and how we can efficiently get through it in the least number of laps possible uh, and achieve the most possible. Um, and, and I think only an older driver with experience of having gone through those hard days of three day tests with three cars at the track in real life, uh, back through the tire war days and, and, and during days when there were fewer sensors on the car and you had to live and breathe it a bit more. Um, and I think that really, it was invaluable experience for me as a driver and I can now apply that to the sim and the younger engineers that are there today uh, and, and help help them, you know, sail through a day that can be sometimes quite taxing um, and, and difficult. So, you know, it, there's there's always more to any job than meets the eye, and, and the simulator job is, is certainly one of them. Um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, mate, and I appreciate you, you being with us so much. Um, and I don't want to end on a negative either, but I know that there have been hard times through your career as well. You're an incredibly mindful guy, incredibly thoughtful in what you do, how you race, how, how you go about what, what you do. Um, you know, there were tough times in the career. We've already talked about, you know, Super Guri pulling out, talking about, you know, the, the, the Toyota today's Peugeot pulling out, for example. But I remember you had your big crash at Le Mans uh, as well. How did you pull through those those difficult moments and and keep that maintain that 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 focus and that motivation? Yeah, I mean, like any any sports person, you go through the ups and the downs. What that sport throws at you, and um, you know, we're there in the spotlight, uh, being assessed and analysed every single time. I mean, I do it on, on the with Sky on the Skypad, <laughs> you know, weekend after weekend, analyzing different drivers. And in a way I feel bad for it because I know that I know they know that they've made a mistake and, and that they feel like perhaps they're the ones that are at fault. But, you know, I'm, I'm just reporting that. And I think I've always looked at myself and things I've done in the car with, with the same critical eye um, and always been hard on myself. But um, yeah, you know, every sports person you, you ride the wave of, of of the ups and downs, and um, yeah, the downs are really they're really hard and and can be mentally difficult to take. Um, you know, we all we often say when it comes down to say like two legends of the sport at the moment, like Verstappen and Hamilton, for example, it becomes a head game because they're basically as good as each other, and it you know may the strongest mind win, and 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 if you start to falter. Your, your your performance is going to lapse. Um, so it, it is a head game and those difficult times, not just in terms of a bad qualifying lap, but moments where you feel like 
you know, where, where a new contract isn't coming along or the phone stops ringing uh, and you go through another Christmas where you're unsure about your, uh, your stability uh, and, and, and ability to bring in an income for your family the next year, stuff like that is very heavy um, and can be a huge weight on the mind. Um, to the point where it can it can make you crumble, really can. Um, everybody's aware of mental health these days. It's being talked about more and more. You know, I've been through it myself. I'm sure many other drivers out on the grid are either going through it right now um, or are about to or have recovered from it. Um, and the performance is directly linked to that. And, and injuries that come along in your career, like you mentioned, there has been some tough times for me. Um, that's that's all part and parcel of it, and you need incredible resilience and strength to to get through those moments. When you're lying in hospital, flat on your back like I was after Le Mans 2012, and you're feeling well, you are a patient, but that feeling of being a patient stays with you for months and months and months, wondering what it's going to be like the next time you drive a car, knowing you have to drive a car again for the for your livelihood. Uh, it's big pressure and again you know those are moments where I'm proud of myself for for climbing that mountain again afterwards and um, and, and, and still achieving great results after that it's um it's it's more than just character building that's for sure well you climbed all the way to the top of the mountain mate uh, huge congratulations on a phenomenal career we will miss watching you on a racetrack because it's always been mesmerizing um but i hope we won't miss you uh, on tv you are one of the the greatest pundits our sport currently has at the moment your your eye uh, your attention to detail is beyond compare just fantastic at everything you do mate uh, enjoy a christmas where you don't have to worry about the contracts and anything else uh, <laughs> enjoy that time with your family mate thank you so much for being on and uh congratulations again mate what a career thank you will yeah i'm i'm, I'm yeah like i say proud of the career i've had and um yeah i wish all the young drivers out there um all the best and uh yeah go get it Now is that part of the show where I like to welcome a guest to the studio. You can tell it's a big show uh, because the boss is in. Uh, former F1 commentator and president of the Motorsport Network, James Allen. Hello, mate. Lovely to have you here, Will. How are uh, you going, Norm? Uh, great. Yeah, yeah, all good. All good. It's normally me welcoming people to the show. Um, uh, mate, uh, obviously, you have such experience in Formula 1, such knowledge of Formula 1 uh, and the Mexican Grand Prix. While not necessarily the most enthralling of races for it's sort of quite a large uh, part of the fan base. I loved it as a high speed game of, of sort of racing chess. Did you enjoy it? I did. I mean, obviously, the, the start was, was, was kind of such a critical part of it. But it's always such an entertaining spectacle anyway, isn't it, Mexico, with the, the crowds and I mean, yet another massive sellout you know, off the back of Austin. I mean, yeah. how huge great ticks in the box for, for people wanting to go back to racing, wanting to buy tickets and, and pack out the grandstand. So it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was more of a tactical one after that, really, wasn't it? And, and I think Red Bull really surprised Mercedes with their race pace. But I just found the start really, really interesting, Will. And, you know, you and I talked a lot about about racing and the mentality of racing drivers but it's really hard to imagine any scenario in which um, Mercedes didn't particularly once they'd locked out the front row in quality on, on Saturday night sit down with all of the videos of all of the starts of the Mexican Grand Prix that have been in recent years and yeah. look at how it works look at how the cars move about what line does what who can do which etc and James Vowles, the, the chief strategist of Mercedes, has come out today and said that the plan was for Bottas from pole to tow Hamilton down the straight and then let him dive down the inside and get going. But obviously, once he didn't get that initial getaway, that, that sort of plan was compromised and things happened pretty quickly. But you would have thought that once he'd not made that initial great getaway, he would have just moved to the left. To, to, to particularly because he hadn't got away mm -hmm. well, to cover off Max from getting down the racing line, being able to break later than them on the rubber and turn in. And uh, I mean, I thought Max executed it brilliantly. 
it was opportunistic and, and fantastic the way that he did it. But you have to sort of wonder how, how that all happened with, with Bottas, don't you? Yeah, Max was pitch perfect, absolutely yeah. pitch perfect. I, I guess one of the strange things was, again, uh, a rewording of the regulations as regarded turn one on the morning of the race. In fact, while the drivers were on the driver's parade, that you weren't going to have to pull to the left-hand side of the bollard mm. if you cut turn one. Perhaps that plan on their minds as to what they could or couldn't do. And I guess by moving to the right, they also help to cut off the potential for Sergio Perez to cut in on the inside of turn one, which looked like theoretically a far easier move for Checo than for Max. But then Valtteri broke so early for mm. the corners. Like everything just added up to mm. allow Max to not even look like he was ever going to run deep down there at, at turn one. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, it is a weird one where you, you in a way, you're better off starting on the second row of the grid in yeah. Mexico than the first. Albeit there's a, a fair deal of jeopardy there in terms of sticking your nose in somewhere and getting the, getting the front wing knocked off. But I, I agree with you. I, I, it's always a slightly tricky when you change the rules partway through a, a race weekend in terms of the, 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 the turn one and the bollards and what have you. But listen, it all, it all adds to the drama, doesn't it? I'm sure Bottas was very mindful as well of not wanting a repeat of Hungary. You know, he, he, he you know, got involved with Verstappen there. It was Hungary, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I don't, he doesn't want to get involved in that again. You know, no. they, they, they need a clean run now, the two title contenders to the, to the final race, and they don't need anybody else getting involved in it. So I, I, there was a lot going on in that race, but knowing how meticulously all Formula One teams, but particularly Mercedes, prepare things like that, it's just, it's just fascinating to see how, how quickly it can unravel. I saw an interesting comment from Luca Filippi uh, today, very successful in junior formula, uh, Formula's uh, XF1 reserve, who'd said, why don't they use spotters like you have in IndyCar, like you have in NASCAR? I remember Takuma Sato, I think, used to have a spotter in F1 just for race starts to tell mm. him where people were around him on that rundown to turn one. Do you think drivers would appreciate having somebody in their rear saying, cover <laughs> left, cover left? It only really works on a long run to turn one, yeah. I guess, doesn't it? Like Monza and, you know, some of those Sochi. Uh, or, uh, I think... I've, and there's so much going on, and they're going pretty quick as well, aren't they? So it's all fre frenetic movement. Yeah. I think it's probably best to just let live <laughs> drivers get on with it. Uh, you mentioned uh, mindset uh, of the drivers. We look at Max, we look at Lewis in this run-in for the championship. You've seen countless championship run-ins with some of the greatest drivers this sport has ever known. What do you make of both Max and Lewis and what you can see perceptively of, of, of where their heads are at going into this? I had the feeling for some time that... that Max is, is, is the one who's sort of looking like he's going to prevail. Um, Mercedes obviously made a, made a step with the car, which got Lewis back in the, in the game a bit. But you, obviously Red Bull have as well mm. uh, more recently. And just that team is, is really, you know, on song. Everything's right. You know, the pit stops are right. The mentality's right. They're pulling together as a team. And even Checo now, is, who had a tricky start, with, you know, it's obviously a very tricky car to drive. It's taken him a while to get to get an understanding of it. He's joining in now as well. So they've got all their ducks kind of lining up, really. And I just see Max has, Max has changed this year, but he's also changed, I think, since the, the massive accident he had at Silverstone and then yeah. the, the follow-up where he, he, he had a decent lead and lost it all and was chasing again. And I think having had that and having it taken away from him, you know, it's, it's just hardened that mindset. You know, people always look for comparisons. I know people sort of say to me a lot, you know, does he remind you of Schumacher? And there were certain things about Max when he first walked into the paddock that reminded me of Michael. But obviously there are a lot of differences as well. But, uh, but I, think, I think there's, what I am seeing with Max is that, is that projection of that steely confidence um, that is actually backed up now with, with a bit more thinking than perhaps there was at, at, at earlier stages. Mm -hmm. And, and he's just got that sort of real certainty and that sure-footedness about him at the moment that I think has taken him to, a, to another level. Lewis is Lewis. I mean, he's exceptional. And he can do things in a racing car. He can make sets of tyres last longer than they should. He can do all kinds of things, you know. He can pull that time out where, you know, of the bag. But, you know, he's, he's right up against it. He knows it. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think, what makes this such a, a fascinating season. Because if you think about the changeovers that we've had, between great drivers. You know, you had, just in, in our sort of career, if you want, you had Senna, who saw Schumacher coming, and Schumacher yeah. got right in his face, as is evident in the oh, documentary, yeah. right, where he hit him at Manny Oh, yeah. Um, then you had, you know, Alonso coming up, and he, he had a good old 
ding dong with Schumacher at the end of Schumacher's career, uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Lewis then with Alonso, and now you know Vettel's come along and had his his period, but Max is the one really. I think his, who's 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 challenging Lewis's crown. He's the next one of that. It's the changing of the guard. That ultra isn't it? ultra sort of special talents. I think that, and and it's great to have a proper proper championship yeah. fight between them. I think it's the one thing we were sort of denied between yeah. Lewis and Seb. We now have with with Lewis and Max. And we were denied it with Senna and Schumacher yeah. as well because sadly Ayrton uh, got killed. You know? Yeah, um, it's wonderful to see Ross Braun in the week saying he could see the similarities between Max and Michael. He said, you know, you're a big part of the of the Senna, uh, the Schumacher sorry documentary. You you've written you know books on Ferrari and 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 on, and on Michael. Uh, you say you can see the similarities between them. And it's impossible to say now, I know, because he's, he's so young in his career, but do you see the hallmarks in his learnings and what he's taking on board and how he's developing in, in what is still quite a short F1 career as putting in place the foundation of the kind of career that Michael had? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Will. I mean, obviously, part of it is who you're racing against. I mean, My Michael was fortunate, I think, that in a sense, uh, that he didn't necessarily have for that much of his racing career drivers on his level to beat. Mm -hmm. You know, Mika was was did a pretty solid job around the time he won the championships, but he couldn't keep it going. He couldn't he couldn't sustain it. Alonso came along at the end and took took Michael's crown. But apart from that, you know, he didn't really have anybody like a Verstappen or a Hamilton to beat. Um, Verstappen's got, you know, I mean, obviously Lewis is towards the end of his career now, but you know better than me because you're closer to it than I am now. But the, the, the caliber of the young guys coming through, the Russells, yeah. the Norrises, particularly the Leclercs, you know, I mean, he's been a little bit quiet with the Ferrari not being so competitive, but he showed some amazing speed. Yeah. And he's got, a, I think he's got a brilliant racing brain, Charles Leclerc, and a very, very strong mentality. So it's a question really of what those other guys are going to do and can they come up to the level? Because I think I think Max is now is it took because he started so young it took him a bit longer to hit that sort of mature that mental maturity sweet spot than it than it, it should have done. But bear in mind he's still only what twenty three twenty four. That's mad, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. So young. So I mean he's the, he's the same age <clears throat> that Michael was when he started, or Lewis was pretty much when he yeah, started. So, yeah. but he's got all this experience now. So how will that play out when he hits the sort of traditional peak years which is sort of 27 through to sort of 32 33 34 depending on how how well you look after yourself you know how, how will he how will that transition i think that will be very, very interesting and then his motivation as well i mean everything i see with max is just you know i mean his dad i think was goading him along he loves it too and all the rest of it but now he's completely it's completely his world it's his thing and he just lives for it doesn't it so i i can see him having a long career and um, and I think it'll be a very, very successful one. <laughs> uh, I know you've got a million and one things to do, but I want to touch on a couple more points before I let you go. Firstly, uh, the fan survey that was just recently released, uh, sort of allied to that, uh, some news today that Formula One will be having graphics around the circuit, really highlighting uh, the importance of the turbo hybrids unit, its efficiency. And that was a really key factor in the responses from the survey how interested how important the fan base finds that element of f1's future yeah i mean uh, that wasn't a big surprise to me you know because I've, I've been sort of in touch with audiences for some time and know that they care about you know motorsport being seen as a platform for for sustainability and and, and good causes as a whole really but particularly says sustainability and i think that's obviously been heightened a little bit now and uh, with the with the cop 26 and yeah. and the growing awareness of of climate change and it, you know this is a critical time for for our sport you, know, you and i were around when they first introduced the the KERS system yeah. in 2009. And at the time I was saying, why are you calling this hybrid? What the heck does KERS mean? It does not mean anything to, to the man or woman in the street, but hybrid, they'll understand it. But you know, all those years have gone by and they never really properly got behind it no. and got behind the messaging. So great that they're doing these banners, but you know, it's, a, it's you know, about time sort of thing. But I think the sustainable fuels thing is another huge part of the future for, for Formula One. Everybody in governments and COP26, they're all talking about electric vehicles. No one's talking about sustainable fuels. But if you can make sustainable fuel, 100% sustainable fuel, pioneer it in racing and put it into road cars, there's over a billion cars on the road. Yeah. You know, I mean, that makes sense to me. So it's like, yes, Formula One has to be a, a platform for all of these things. 
And, um, and I, I personally think the next five to ten years is a critical time for our sport because you've got, you've got massive disruption from external factors like climate change debate, things like video streaming that changes the whole way in which the sport is delivered. Social media is already having a huge impact. You know, gamification. Those, just those four topics right there are having a huge external force on motorsport. It has great opportunities, but also if it doesn't address it properly, it could be a big threat. Uh, and allied to that, segueing across to the fact we, we have an FIA presidential election at the end of the year, as you say, five to ten years in which the world uh, of the automobile will change beyond recognition. How important do you think this election at the end of the year is going to be, not just for the sport, but for the way in which we go about driving? Well, to be honest with you, Will, without wishing to over-dramatise it, I'd say it's probably the most important FIA presidential election that there's been certainly in my during my professional career mm. um, because what happened before was different versions of continuity of of, a, of the same thing right it's the it was the scale of the industry it's to what extent the manufacturers are involved and you know how you manage the different racing series how you boost rallying or boost boost endurance rate whatever it may be now it's like what's the powertrain of the future yeah. you know how do we get far more women and more people from diverse backgrounds into the sport all of these things it's, these are very much broader and more challenging topics right and they're fundamental to the future success of the sport what i find enormously positive and exciting is the fact that things like you know drive to survive that you've yeah. been fundamentally involved with i bet you can't believe how much of an impact it's that's massive. had right massive. I mean, the funnel effect of finding new fans, bringing them into the sport. They then find out the kind of content they're looking for on social media, be it the teams, be it the drivers. I mean, a big part, I reckon, of the reason why McLaren came out as the most popular team in that fan survey you referenced, is just because they're really, really good, very yeah. engaging at the social media when the, you know, they're a marketing-led team, you know, when, when people come in through Drive to Survive. I mean, the evidence is everywhere. So that's fantastically positive for the sport. It shows there's a real appetite for it, but we've got to, got to capitalize on that and not sort of try and um, stick with the old ways of doing things. We need new ways of doing things, and that's why whoever wins this election is, uh, is, is got a big job on, but, and a lot of responsibility. Exciting times, important times. Yes. Uh, more importantly, uh, James, thanks so much for well, I say for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me in the office That's and, brilliant. and, well, we and love having the show. Uh, thanks so much, my man. Cheers. And that's just about all we've got time for on this week's episode of This Week. Things we learned this week. Anthony Davidson won't be joining a brass band anytime soon. Nick DeVries has gone all corporate. Jamie Chadwick wouldn't mind racing stateside. And Carl Larson's going on holiday to Abu Dhabi. And uh, if he can swing it, I think mostly with his wife, would love to drive an F1 car at the Rookie Test. Uh, it's been a really enjoyable week. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks, and we'll see you next week for next week's edition of This Week.